Thank you, Robert. Uh, so, uh, as Robert just mentioned, I'm Joe Johnson. I am a fish biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I'm at the Lower Great Lakes um, office, which is about halfway between Buffalo and Rochester. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the brains of this operation. Uh, Dmitry Gorski, he thinks up really great ideas. I do my best to try to make them happen. So we're going to talk about historical lake sturgeon sightings in the Upper Niagara River um, and how that can inform habitat characterization efforts. So since this is the sturgeon session, I'm not going to talk a lot about the life history of sturgeon. I'm just going to dive right in with some site specifics um, about lake sturgeon. And so these pictures are actually both uh, Genesee stocking photos. Um, I have to cheat a little. You'll see why as to um, any juvenile pictures that we can use. But so in the Buffalo Harbor on the furthest eastern end of Lake Erie, uh, there was a lot of modeling done to try to estimate the adult population. And the best number they came at was about slightly under 900. Um, but the upper Niagara River, we currently don't know the status. We know that the adults are spawning near the headwaters of the river. Uh, and we expect that the juveniles may be moving downstream as they would in other systems, including some other connecting channels. And we've seen before um, habitat suitability index models successfully be applied in a wide number of uh, systems, not only for lake sturgeon, but other sturgeon species and other fish species as well. And this is nice because once we have that data collected, you can actually apply the model to various life stages. So for the purposes of this talk, uh, we are concerned about uh, juveniles specifically and we know that they um, tend to prefer gravel substrates and sand substrates um, that, are, uh, that their benthic prey uh, can reside in. A little bit less high flows than the adults do because they don't um, need to spawn, obviously, as juveniles. And then the literature suggests that they like to occupy the deepest area um, available to them within those systems. So uh, these maps here are just to contextualize the Upper Niagara River specifically. And so I'm talking about upstream of the falls, which is right around here. Um, this is Grand Island that splits the channel, and the flow goes this way, um, feeding into Lake Ontario. And so um, the map on the left is from the Canadian uh, delisting strategy for the area of concern. Niagara River is an area of concern. And it shows habitat projects within the Canadian and US side. And then on the right-hand side uh, shows habitat restoration projects through the Greenway Ecological Committee. So that is to offset NIPA um, water withdrawal fluctuations. But both of these maps indicate that a lot of the habitat restoration projects in the Upper Niagara River are terrestrial based. There are very few um, fish habitat restoration projects. And so that was one reason why we wanted to investigate how habitat is for um, under in the water. And so keeping with the theme of this conference, uh, then and now, uh, thank you for the perfect uh, theme. Uh, we took a look at some historical data that we have for Lake Sturgeon in the Upper Niagara River. And so this data set came from angler accounts as well as scientific dive surveys in the mid-1990s. And so we used that data to inform the methods that we are currently doing. So for the last few years, um, my colleague Greg Cronish did an excellent talk on the Lower Niagara River. We've been working in the lower downstream of the falls recently. Um, but last year, we revitalized our fish sampling efforts upstream of the falls. And this year, we collected all of the data that we would like to plug into our habitat suitability index model. So we collected it on substrate and depth, and then flow is going to be estimated. And the overarching goal is to inform the Niagara River AOC Habitat Subcommittee. So taking a look at um, some of the historical data, uh, keep in mind, because this is from scuba surveys, most of the um, size estimates for fish is actually visually estimated. So this isn't perfect, um, but we tried to bend the data up based off of the green are the juveniles. We have quite a few um, adults, which is the purple side, and then you know we have a sub-adult. Uh, this is from the Bose et al. estimation for size. Um, so we're not going to include the sub-adults because we're not specifically sure, based off visual estimates, um, where they really fell. But if you look, take a look at the map, you can see a lot of the juvenile sightings were at the northern end of Grand Island and then along the eastern channel, as well as on the Canadian side, there's a creek called Frenchman's Creek that lets out there. And taking a look at the estimated depths for only the juveniles, so throwing out the adults and the sub-adults, um, these were dives, so it's not surprising that we have more observations in the summer months when it's warmer to go diving. Um, but the estimated depths 
Uh, you see in the upper Niagara River, we're limited by about 12 meters in our deepest spots. And so a lot of the depths that were observed um, are actually quite similar. And then the substrate types um, and intermediate. The substrate types where the juveniles were observed, this is not surprising to us, is mostly sand, gravel, and bedrock. Um, I do have to note that looking, uh, one of the joys of working with historical data sets is uh, you don't always know every detail. So with the substrate types, they weren't quantified as to which one is the primary, which is not. So some of these are actually combination observations. Someone may have observed a juvenile over sand and gra gravel, so I applied a one for each to um, graph that out. So that's a little caveat there. So the current methods, what are we doing um, today? So we have this really nice uh, multi-beam. Uh, we are taking bathymetry, high-resolution bathymetry um, data, as well as side scan snippets. So Amanda did a great job outlining um, the concepts of side scan sonar, but we are at a different resolution, and so we are not looking um, for individual fish, we are looking at the substrate. Just wanna clarify that. We have a pole-mounted multi-beam. It sits over the gunnel of our Boston whaler. Um, and it's a really nice unit. And then those antennas on top, um, by the time we're done, we can get within three centimeters of um, our navigation track. So it's very, um, very, very specific and accurate. When you're talking about using a multi-beam, it uh, hinges on uh, sending out a sound wave and listening for it to come back. So we have to know what the speed of sound is underwater. So our sound velocity profiles are very important. And then we also take drop camera videos uh, USGS partners made us this awesome cage over here that we have a video camera mounted to. It has known uh, measurements on the side so that we can really quantify the substrate that way. That silver box is the brains, um, and then we also have a battery operation there uh, to stow away, uh, or to get clean DC power for our um, multi-beam. And then concurrently, we have been using baited set lines mostly as our um, as our fishing gear, we've tried gill nets, but in the upper Niagara River, the velocity um, doesn't make it necessarily safe in a lot of places to do gill nets, as well as we have a lot of cladophora, which is a, a, an algae that sloughs off, and it makes our nets, a gill nets, unfishable. It's just like a wall of green within an hour or so. So mostly baited set lines. So we throw on some tunes, and we drive about two and a half miles per hour all day. It's very fun. Um, one of the most exciting things that happened was uh, one of our transect lines aligned perfectly with the U.S.-Canadian border. That was a very happy accident. Um, that was a fun day. So um, we have a, a pretty confined setup to um, underneath the cabin. We have the batteries mounted down there, and then we can break down our whole pole and put it in the um, front of the boat. And we only pick beautiful days to go out, so that's kind of uh, nice, too. We need very flat water. So taking a look at um, where we have placed all of our set lines, um, <clears throat> no one can say we didn't try. Uh, we have placed set lines all throughout um, pretty good distribution anywhere we could. Uh, I think we did eight gill nets and 150 set lines over the last two years. Um, we have caught zero fish, unfortunately. Uh, and then our, our habitat um, scanning, we've scanned 460 hectares overall. You can see a lot of these survey areas align well with those hotspots that juveniles were found, but some of them don't, and that's the beauty of an HSI, so not everything is predicted to be perfect habitat. So 460 hectares. Uh, as a Buffalonian, it's my duty, even though I don't really care, uh, to uh, say go Bills, and uh, that's about 1,138 football fields. If you're not familiar with the imperial system, that's um, 645 metric football fields. So taking a look at some of the bathymetry and side scan data. Um, Amanda did a great job of explaining this takes a long time, so I'm not just lazy. Uh, it takes a while to process all the data. We analyze our navigation files and, and um, our sonar files in a few different softwares. And then for those videos, we are using the NOAA classification scheme. Um, this is called CMEX. It's a disgusting document. It's like 500 pages long. Um, but basically what it does is tell you what I call rocks is what you call rocks, what I call mud, you would call mud. And so it makes that uh, a nice standardized uh, framework for that. And then our bathymetry data is at a higher resolution than what is um, currently existing in a, um, a HECRAS model that Army Corps of Engineers has already developed. 
And so we are going to give them that higher resolution data so that they can estimate flow um, at the bottom. So this is a benthic fish, so we care what the flow is like down there, not up top. And we're going to plug all of this into um, a, an HSI model in um, GIS. And so these blue bars of progress here, these are really large data sets. So when you're importing them, um, don't hit cancel, just uh, be happy with your blue bars of progress. So. Um, so like I said, we have not caught any fish yet, but hope still remains. So we know we have colleagues who work with Lake Sturgeon in the um, St. Clair and the Detroit system where there are a lot of juveniles and they might only get one or two individuals for every 70 or so set lines they put out. So it's a hard catchability rate. We're still analyzing a lot of the data and we're still classifying those videos. Um, we'd like to get another person to uh, classify the videos because even within that NOAA framework, it's still a little bit subjective. So we want like a second reader like you would do with otoliths. Um, but here are some example photographs that you can see. And I'm listing the primary and the secondary subgroup um, for each of these substrates. So you can get a reference of what um, these substrates look like. And then I threw that 1990s uh, figure back up to compare to, um, we only have 30 videos classified so far, but you can already see that there's been a big change with Dreisenitz since the 1990s. Um, and so, and this is 60 observations in total because that graph illustrates the primary and the secondary substrate. So we have a really big uh, drastic difference in uh, the physical habitat. Taking a sneak peek at some of the bathymetry data, uh, Strawberry Island is just south of Grand Island in the upper, and so this is a very popular angling uh, area, and so when we get anecdotal accounts of sturgeon, a lot of people say, they, oh, I saw one by, by Strawberry Island. Um, this is kind of an interesting area, so it does have a nice deep hole, um, but then it also like has shallowed up mounds um, nearby, so that's a difference. Um, the red is uh, three and a half meters, and the, blue, the darkest blue is 10 and a half meters. Um, taking a look at uh, uh, the western end of Grand Island, this is just kind of neat. I wanted to introduce that horizontal line you see where there's a very deep mark and a very shallow mark is actually just a pipeline going through. So um, we can get a, a good idea of what the depth is looking like. So taking a look at our side scan snippets, um, we wanted to integrate the videos into the GIS layer. Um, so there's a couple of ways to, uh, to address this. You could either uh, go ahead and digitally uh, digitize every single rock if you'd like. Um, but what, one thing that I'm going to try is I have a point layer now, so a vector layer that I'm trying to use to train um, and auto-classify the substrate types. So these dark blue dots, um, you can see I have the videos integrated into GIS and that is dark blue is showing where the primary is Dracene and muscle hash. The secondary there is grapple. So you can see there's a lot of muscle hash um, areas there at Strawberry Island. So what are the next steps? Um, continuing to analyze the bathymetry and the side scan data, and then providing that data set to Army Corps of Engineers, um, and they're going to come up with those bottom velocity estimates. Developing and running our HSI, um, and that will inform us whether or not we need to conduct additional surveying um, or possibly ground truthing. We do have an ADCP if we needed um, to get more specific velocity estimates. And then we're going to revitalize the scientific dive um, survey. So um, it, we want to do some drift dives to try to see can we find fish in that way. Um, and yeah, the overall goal is can we find some lake sturgeon. Um, in conclusion, I would definitely say, I mean, Dan is better at math than me, but I think all of those zeros don't necessarily tell us that there are zero fish. Uh, we need to conduct more sampling in order to accurately describe. Uh, but even just these preliminary results indicate to us there are some very clear habitat differences since the 1990s, namely dry cements. Um, but there's also, if it turned out that there weren't actually juveniles, which we cannot say that at this point, um, but there have been other biological perturbations that may have affected recruitment. Uh, so we know that there was a, a few major botulism outbreaks in the upper Niagara River. Um, we also know there's other invasives, namely round goby, which can be an intermediate for botulism, but it's also an egg predator. So what do we do <laughs> if we find that um, there isn't enough habitat? We can install gravel beds um, and we need to 
think of a really great way to get rid of all of these muscles. Uh, so let's put our heads together there. Uh, we did joke about maybe we could suck them all up and grind them up and use them for our anchors, uh, for our telemetry work. Um, but we've got to figure something out there. Uh, once this model is complete, we will be able to apply to other species. So in the Niagara River, there's also a lot of native mussel restoration going on, or we could apply it to um, potentially seeing if any invasives are coming in. Um, and so with that, I just want to acknowledge our funding sources. So this project was funded through Gleary, um, which came to us from EPA and the Niagara River AOC committee. Um, and I want to give huge gratitude out to the rest of our Lower Great League Lower Great Lakes team, um, in particular, Zai B. Singer and Chris Castiglione, who really laid a lot of the groundwork for this project, um, as well as my colleagues Cori Eddy, Alex Gatch, Gregory Cronish, and Kyle Morton, um, and our partners over at Army Corps in the Buffalo District. Um, and with that, I also want to remind everyone, Alex Gatch, um, they saved the best for last, so he's the very last talk of this conference, so if you're already here, um, please go see him, as well as Jared Ludwig is um, after me, so there's still two more talks today. With that, I can take any questions, um, and I will say this is a, a juvenile that was caught in the lower Niagara River that actually was sourced from the Genesee. This picture is almost four years old, so we need a new one at this point. Um, we're hoping to get one this year. With that, I can take any questions.